Hello, my name is Humphrey. This talk is about our paper, Envisioning the Invisibility of Discrete and Wearable AAC Devices, undertaken by HCI researchers at King's College London. High-tech augmentative and alternative communication devices can offer communication support for those with complex communication needs. Yet, these devices face low rates of long-term adoption. Abandonment of AAC devices has been linked to many factors, particularly stigma from the visibility of the device and its intrusion into other essential modes of communication, such as nonverbal body language. Yet, visible AAC is strategically useful for setting conversational expectations and improving awareness of underlying disability. Therefore, this is the first paper to explore how we might design invisible AAC devices. Firstly, we used user-centered design cycles to develop three high-fidelity prototypes. Following this, we held two complementary focus groups with people with the language impairment aphasia. User-centered design activities for the three high-fidelity prototypes were conducted with a broad demographic of communities with CCNs, specialists and stakeholders. The first prototype, Prompt Me Out, is a discrete wearable application devised for people with aphasia who experience challenges with public speaking. On command, the device will prompt the user with the very next word of pre-prepared dialogue discreetly and unbeknownst to the conversation partner. The second prototype, My Speech OS, is a wearable and discrete smartwatch application which enables users to construct sentences and dialogue on the basis of ordering images, symbols, and sounds. Unlike traditional speech generating devices, the smartwatch form factor affords the user with a discrete and wearable dialogue support, whilst not undermining critical pathways for nonverbal and embodied forms of communication. The third prototype, the STT badge, provides a live transcription of the wearer's dialogue, including in noisy environments. Envisaged context for the STT badge includes face-to-face -face services, for instance, bank tellers, shop clerks, and teachers in schools. The STT badge was honed on the basis of survey results from the deaf and hard of hearing community to determine the optimal user interface. We then held two complementary focus groups with people with aphasia spaced one week apart. Across both focus groups, we had 12 participants with aphasia, their language difficulties ranged from severe to mild, and five participants had paralysis onset by hemiplegia. The focus groups were supported by three speech and language therapists. Using accessibility guidance from Mac et al., both focus groups were conducted in a familiar location at a speech and language therapy centre. Focus group one supported participants' discussion of regularly encountered communication challenges and the co-design of low-fidelity discrete and wearable AAC prototypes which afford differing levels of public visibility. In the vein of divergent design thinking, we wanted participants to feel empowered to discuss a high volume of problems and solutions. We used Lindsay et al's video prompts to support creativity, facilitate easier communication, and improve overall ideation. The six prompted contexts, coffee shops, the doctors, public transport, supermarkets, eating out, and time with friends and family were communication locations derived from PARS ethnographic data on the lives of people with aphasia. Low fidelity prototyping let participants devise solutions for their varying communication challenges using craft materials. Focus group two favored a convergent design thinking methodology. Participants with aphasia analytically critiqued the three high fidelity prototypes designed during the user-centered design process, namely Prompt Me Out, My Speech OS, and the STT badge. This methodology is advocated by Wilson et al, with high fidelity prototypes empowering participants with aphasia through tangible design and minimizing conceptual demands. Participants were prompted with analytical questions about each prototype, and consensus was gathered over refinements to each prototype. Both focus groups were recorded, transcribed, and organized using in vivo, after which we applied thematic analysis and restructured the qualitative data into themes. This process resulted in two themes and four sub-themes in total. Theme one considers psychological and contextual factors that restrain people with aphasia's communication. Its initial sub-theme focuses on living with aphasia in everyday social contexts. 
and the subsequent difficulties that arise from having an often invisible disability. For example, in the following video, Rick, who has no bodily paralysis, describes the difficulty of communicating and asking for a seat on public transport, with strangers completely unaware of his aphasia and underlying disability. Uh, not, 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 not believing, but not even knowing that I've had a stroke, because physically I look normal. But well, they don't, you know, they just look at you like, oh, why do I do need a seat? The secondary sub-theme focuses on the negative emotions and potentially traumatic communication experiences for people with aphasia. For instance, Grace in the following video describes the challenge of communicating with aphasia when there is extreme social pressure from an impatient queue at a coffee shop. And if you've got a queue behind you, mm -hmm. sort of tutting, oh, you know, that queue, makes yeah, it yeah, really worse. Like, oh, 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 I can't spit it out, oh, I can't spit it out, I was oh, sighing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, yeah. yes, I think we all find this slightly mm. tricky. Meanwhile, Theme 2 notes that positive emotions and externally visible supports can empower people with aphasia's communication. In particular, the first sub-theme notes that positive emotions, habits and routines improve access and forge independence for people with aphasia. As Grace explains in the following video, her routine of ordering coffee means that her mind is not blank with dialogue and she no longer relies upon others to order on her behalf. Because in a stressful situation, your, your brain goes all, or my brain goes all fuzzy. Mm. Yeah. But it's practice, practice, practice. And now I can order my, it's always the same, Americano without any milk. The secondary sub-theme focuses on the role of external technologies for supporting communication. Family, apps and low-tech supports are often integral for supporting people with aphasia's communication and confidence. As captured in the following video, several of the groups stress the importance of Google Maps for solo navigation to unfamiliar locations. Do you guys use any apps to get around, like Google Maps? Yes. Apps. Um, yes. I mean, if I phone in the, uh, I'm on a narrow area, then I've got my, I just look at my thing. I don't know the name of it. Works. Maps, yeah. Google yeah, Maps. Maps, yeah. yeah. Participants then co-designed low fidelity AAC prototype solutions. In total, participants built seven AAC prototypes with varying form factors. The prototypes had different body placement and public visibility. One notable participant design included the wearable AAC badge, which participants envisaged to be highly visible to display key information to strangers, such as, I have a disability, I have aphasia, and I have had a stroke. Yet when turned off, the badge could equally blend into the colour of the user's clothing, altering its visibility, becoming discreet and unobtrusive. Beyond the low fidelity designs, Participants equally had a variety of meaningful critiques and suggestions for the three high fidelity prototypes. Prompt Me Out was considered useful for public speaking engagements, yet participants stressed the importance of device performance due to its discreetness as an error ball. The STT badge was considered useful in noisy environments and group conversations. Suggestions for improvement included providing a touchscreen to let users scroll back to earlier parts of the conversation. Lastly, my speech OS was positively evaluated by smartwatch adopters. Critiques of the device predominantly considered the device text size and fewer buttons within the user interface. So what does this mean for invisible and discrete wearable AAC? Users should ultimately have the autonomy to control the visibility of their assistive technology depending on the setting and communication partners. Highly visible AAC devices can undeniably be strategically useful in specific circumstances. Participants co-designed both visible and invisible AAC devices. They wanted devices capable of blending into clothing and selectively capable of becoming very socially visible. Regarding recommendations for future research, this work provides further evidence for the co-design of human-centered high-tech AAC devices. Future AAC devices should look to leverage embodied and non-verbal forms of communicative expression. Creative input and output modalities can support more usable AAC devices. Ultimately, AC devices should try to build end users' confidence and self-esteem. 
A huge thanks to Aphasia Reconnect for making this research possible.